going to tell you about one trip where I got bolder than ever in terms of what I was trying to do. Each time that I went to Cuba, I realized that people were being denied access to information. Many people had never been exposed to a basics of catechism because atheism was the rule of the land. And I had connected with my own family members, lay people in the Catholic church and some heroic priests who were trying to resist the ideology and control of the Cuban regime. At the same time, being a Cuban American, I knew powerful people in the Cuban American community. And I would meet with them in secret in the United States and they would give me a list of political prisoners in Cuba and ask me to carry thousands of dollars to their wives. So on this trip in 2005, I was carrying $4,000 in cash, all in $20 bills with a tiny piece of paper as small as I could possibly write with the names of the dissidents whose families I was going to try to contact. Beyond that, some friends in the Catholic church had asked me to take a DVD player to a Cuban priest so that as part of his catechism classes, he could show movies. I was taking men's clothing, you know, size 10 shoes to my Cuban friend's family. This Cuban friend also asked me to carry a letter and put it at the grave of his deceased mother. Some other friends in the Catholic church sent me pamphlets um, about catechism and a box of rosaries. The night before I left, a Cuban friend came over and we packed my suitcase very carefully to make it seem like everything in there belonged to me personally. Yes, even the size 10 men's shoes somehow were going to be mine. An American friend who had traveled to Cuba as part of a medical conference, she called me on the phone and she said, Margarita, listen, you're going to be fine. But the main thing is when you go through customs, don't let on that you even speak Spanish. Why don't you just put on a sombrero and some pink lipstick and for goodness sake, don't look so serious and smart and pretend like you're just another foreign tourist going to hang out with the good looking Cuban guys and have a good time. So that's what I did. I flew from Princeton to Cancun. I pretended like I didn't speak Spanish put on a big hat, some pink lipstick, and played dumb. But I hit a hitch. As they're checking my passport and immigration, I have a US passport. My name, Margarita, could be anything, you know, I could be Italian. So I'm pretending like I don't understand what she's saying, but she takes my bag and she puts it through a scanner. And she saw the DVD player. I'm cool. This is my personal DVD player. It's mine. It's mine. It's mine. Well, she opened it up. And in all that packing, I hadn't pulled off the plastic covering the DVD. And it was obvious that it was brand new. So she looked at me. Mm-hmm. And she took me over and she put me in line for a special inspection in customs. It was July 31st. I was in the airport in Havana and I was sweating bullets and I was terrified and I was angry and I was about to cry because I thought my line was busted and everything I had was going to get taken from me. There were a couple of German tourists in front of me and the police were going through unrolling every pair of socks, taking everything out of the suitcase and examining the lining. They knew very well that people pretend to be tourists and take all kinds of prohibited items into Cuba. So here I am pretending I don't speak Spanish, I'm fluent in Spanish and I'm speaking English, but I'm praying inside of my head in Spanish. And so I just blurt it out in my head, Santa Maria Siempre Virgen, Sangre de Cristo, San Ignacio de Loyola, sácame de aquí. Blood of Christ, Blessed Virgin Mary, Saint Ignatius of Loyola, because it was his feast day, July 31st, 
get me out of here. Then they called me up. Aha, uh -huh, DVD player. It's mine, it's mine. Um, then I heard them say in Spanish, oh, we're gonna get someone else to come over and find out how often she comes into Cuba because they know that tourists who come to Cuba are often bringing illegal items. So I'm just sweating. The head honcho comes over and he says to me in Spanish, when was the last time you were here? I forget I don't speak Spanish. I, so I, I reply, but I reply in English, 2002, huh? Because he doesn't speak English. And then I screamed in English, 2002. And he looks at me and he goes, go over there. And I thought I was gonna be sent to a room to be strip searched. And I'm looking around for where he's sending me. He took me to the exit and he told me to leave. And I walked out and there's my cousin, Celia Rosa. Hey, mommy! And she's screaming and yelling at me in Spanish. I'm terrified they're following me. I grab her and I'm like, Celia Rosa, vamos, vamos. Like, let's go fast. Come on, go, go, go. We went to her apartment in Havana and I couldn't sleep the whole night because I was so scared. At the same time, I felt like such a coward because I knew that this was exactly the reality that people in Cuba had to live with every single day. They lie, they cover up what's inside their bags, and if they get caught, they try to come up with some kind of an excuse so they don't get punished or jailed for doing things as simple as wanting to watch a DVD player or pray the rosary. Later in that trip, I was in Santiago de Cuba, which is on the Eastern side of the island. And one of the people to see on my list was a human rights activist. And I had been instructed to call his sister who had a license to run a small home-based um, restaurant called a paladar and meet him there. So I called and you, know, you speak in this sort of coded language um, and I figured she'd understand what I was trying to do. I wanted to meet her brother and she gave me a time and I showed up. When I showed up, her brother was there and he said to me, I'm really sorry, but my sister made a mistake. My phone line is tapped. And she called and said, there was a foreigner here who wanted to meet with me and I've been followed. Look out the window. And there was this guy in a Cuban military uniform standing on the corner upright, looking straight up at our balcony. And he said, and I got nervous. And he said, it's okay, it's okay. Look, they do this all the time. He's probably not gonna stop you when you leave, but he's trying to scare you. And he wants you to know that you're being followed. So the best thing you can do is pretend like you don't see him and you don't care. So he sent me out to the balcony to have a drink and pretend like I was having a good time for about 30 minutes. Afterwards, I came back in, I did the interview with him. I wrote down all of the things he was telling me about the human rights violations in Cuba, rolled it up in a little piece of paper, stuck it inside of my bra, took my camera, took out the digital photos of him and other dissidents I had been meeting with, put a different digital camera, a digital file in there that had pictures of me doing touristy things in case they took my camera and I was just having fun. And I walked out and he told me, do not go back to your host right now because they're following you. I was staying with a Cuban family that I was friends with, this time pretending not to be an American, but to be their relative from Havana um, because the Committee for the Defense of Revolution will come and knock on your door if there's someone staying there who's not normally there. They need to know who I am. So I was pretending to be a Cuban from another part of the island. And I walked out that day and I was scared. I walked to the central plaza in Santiago de Cuba and I walked into church. And a priest was preaching from Corinthians 2nd, the second letter of Corinthians, verse number four. Sorry, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 8. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not abandoned, but, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. 
struck down but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. After a little while, I walked back to the house where I was staying in Santiago and my hostess, whose name was also Margarita, said to me, I don't know where you went, but you were gone for a long time and I think I know what you were doing. And I'm gonna tell you something, tu estás marcada. You have been marked. That's what she told me. That's a Cuban word for you've been found out, you've been discovered, and they're watching you. The hard part was that even though I loved her and I trusted her and I wanted to help her, the Cuban regime makes it so that you don't tell the people in your own family or friendship circle where you're going or who you're talking to. Because if they know and you won't give information, they will go after your family and your friends. I don't share these stories very often because I struggle with the reality that although I thought I was doing something courageous, I was actually too scared to go back. And there was parts of me that wanted to continue helping directly political prisoners and dissidents in the church in Cuba. But I realized that I had to make a choice and that if I was going to speak with my full conscience about what I believed to be true and right and good, I wasn't gonna be allowed in. 